This video is part of a series that I'm making in order to support a course for introductory proof writing. So on the last video, we talked about direct proofs and gave an outline for writing a direct proof. And in this video, we're going to, again, look at the method of direct proof, but when you need to use different cases. So let's look at this outline that we did in the last video. So let's say we've got a proposition that says if P, then Q then the proof needs to have the following kind of structure. So you wanna start off by supposing that P is true. So P is going to be some mathematical statement and it's gonna end saying thus Q, which means Q is true. And then in the middle is where you do all of the mathematics. So in general, the first thing that you will do is unpack P using definitions. So maybe P is something like F is a continuous function, then you unpack what it means for a function to be continuous, for instance. Then your middle step will be involving calculations and logical arguments. And so that's gonna vary depending on what proof you're writing. It could be wildly different. And then the last thing that you'll do before your conclusion is you will repack Q using definitions. So it's kind of the reverse of this unpacking of P. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into our examples. We'll do several today. So the first one is the following proposition. So it says, if n is a natural number, so that means a positive integer, then one plus minus one to the n times two n minus one is a multiple of four. Okay, so let's get to it. There's not much to do for unpacking P, which is if N is a natural number, because the definition of the natural numbers doesn't really require any unpacking. And the hint that we need to break this into two cases is the fact that we've got a minus one to the N. We know that minus one to the N will be positive if N is even, and it'll be negative one if N is odd. So let's go ahead and get to it. So we're gonna suppose that N is a natural number, so that's our first step. And then we see that there are two cases. And so we'll have case one, which is N is even. And we might as well write down case two while we're at it, but we'll do these both separately. So case number two is N is odd. Now we use the definition of an even and odd number, just like we set up on the last uh, video. So if n is even, then it's equal to two times some other natural number. So let's do that. So n equals two times a for some natural number a. Okay, great. Now what we'll do is plug n into this equation, but now n is equal to two times a. So let's see what we get. We'll get one plus minus one to the two a, and then it'll be four a minus one. Okay, but now notice that here, this minus one to the two a will be a plus one. So that'll give us one plus four a minus one, which is equal to four a, which is a multiple of four. So let's maybe write that down, a multiple of, okay. So now let's look at this other case when n is odd. So that means that n is equal to two a minus one, for a some natural number. So that's the definition of an odd number. Okay, but now we wanna look at the object one plus minus one to the two a plus one times two times two a minus one, sorry, I should say minus one and then minus one like that. Okay, but now we've got minus one to the two a minus one that's gonna be minus one because we have an odd number up there. So this boils down to one minus. Now we can simplify this down to four a minus two minus one, so it'll be four a minus three. But now putting that all together, we see that this is minus four a minus four, which is the same thing as four times minus a minus one, which is again a multiple of four. And so regardless of having an even number or having an odd number, we still get that this thing is a multiple of four. And so that finishes this proof. Okay, so let's clean this up and we'll look at a couple more examples. So our next example will be the following inequality over the real numbers. So it says if X is a real number, 
then x plus the absolute value of x minus 5 is bigger than or equal to 5. So we're going to break this into two cases just like we did in the last setup. And which two cases? Well, it depends on this absolute value function. So notice something is happening at x equals 5. This changes from being x minus 5 to minus x minus 5, depending on which side of 5 we're at. So that's how we're going to make these two cases. So let's maybe go ahead and get started. So let's suppose x is a real number. Then we have x is bigger than or equal to 5, or x is less than 5. And those will be our two cases. So let's maybe look at case number one. That'll be x is bigger than or equal to 5. But notice if x is bigger than or equal to 5, we have x minus 5 is bigger than or equal to 0, which tells us the absolute value of x minus 5 is really just x minus 5. So we can just go ahead and delete the absolute values from this whole setup. Okay, so now let's look at the left-hand side of our goal inequality. We've got the absolute value of x plus, sorry, x plus the absolute value of x minus 5 is now going to be equal to x plus x minus 5. Again, because we can just get rid of the absolute values in this case. But we know that x is bigger than or equal to 5, which means x plus x is bigger than or equal to 10. Or we can just have 5 plus 5 minus 5, where I've replaced x with 5 using this inequality. But now notice one of those 5s cancels with the other one, and we get that this thing is equal to 5. So we have our goal expression is bigger than or equal to 5, just like we wanted. Now let's go on to case 2 which will be the disjoint case from this when x is less than 5. So let's say x is less than 5. Then we have x minus 5 is less than 0, which means that x minus 5 is equal to 5 minus x, right? We're really, we generally think about that as like x minus 5 in absolute values being equal to minus x minus 5, but we can like cleanly write it like that. Okay, so now let's make the same calculation. So x plus absolute value x minus 5, in this case, will be x plus 5 minus x, like that. But now notice that that's exactly equal to 5. This x and this x cancel. So we just get that this thing is equal to 5, but 5 is most definitely bigger than or equal to 5. So notice, we started with x as a real number, and regardless of which case it fell into, we got the appropriate inequality. So that finishes this proof. Okay, so let's maybe we'll look at two more. For our next example, we will show that if m is an integer, then 2 times m squared plus 3 is always odd. So this is pretty similar to the first one in that we want to break it into cases when m is even or m is odd. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's suppose m is an integer, then m is even or odd. We know that the even numbers and the odd numbers partition the integers, so that breaks all of the integers into one of those cases. Now let's jump into the cases. So case number one will be m is even. Well, that means we can write m as 2 times a for some a, which is an integer. So that's the definition of an even integer. OK, but now let's look at 2m squared plus 3 in this case. And notice that that's going to be 2 times 2a squared plus 3, like that. But now doing some arithmetic, we'll have 2 squared times 2, which is 4, times 2, which is 8. So that's going to be 8a squared plus 3, like that. But we can do a little tricky arithmetic and write that as 2 times 4a squared plus 1 plus 1. In other words, we've got this of the form an even number which we could maybe rewrite this as b plus 1, but that's the definition of an odd number. So maybe we could finish this off with saying which is odd. Now let's look at the next case. So case number 2, 
will be n is, sorry, m is odd. So m is odd. Okay, so that means that m can be written as 2a plus 1 for, again, some integer a. Now we just make the same calculation, but it will be m is equal to 2a plus 1 in this case. So we've got 2m squared plus 3 is now equal to 2 times 2a plus 1 squared plus 3, like that. Now we can multiply out this 2a plus 1 squared. That's going to give us 2 times 4a squared plus 4a plus 1 plus 3, like that. Okay. Next, maybe we could take this 3 and rewrite it as a 2 plus 1 and then bring one of these 2's inside of those parentheses. Notice the parentheses is being multiplied by 2, so when that 2 comes inside the parentheses, it turns into a 1. That's going to leave us with 2 times 4a squared plus 4a plus 1 plus 1, which is 2, plus 1. That's what's left over after this 3 has been split up. But again, this is very clearly odd because it's an even number plus 1. And so regardless of the case, we got that this was odd. Okay, so we'll do one more. For our last example, we'll do something that's a little bit different. We'll look at this statement that says, if m and n have opposite parity, then m plus n is odd. Now we could do this in a very straightforward way just like we've done all of the other ones in this video. We could break it into two cases. One case where m is even and n is odd, and one case where m is odd and n is even. But we see that there is some sort of symmetry built into the conclusion here. And that symmetry is that m can be switched with n, and there's no change in this statement at all. But what that means is that we can cover both of these cases at the same time. And we can do that by using this common mathematical phrase without loss of generality. Now you have to be really careful when you can use this and when you can't. So you can only use it if switching the two identities of the variables doesn't really change anything at all. So we'll see other cases of this as we move forward in the course, but here's a very simple case. So we'll write this proof doing both cases at once using this phrase. So let's maybe go ahead and do that. So without loss of generality, so a lot of times when writing on the chalkboard or when writing a first draft of a proof or something like that, we'll shorten this to WLOG like that. So without loss of generality, let's assume M is even and N is odd. So what I mean by without loss of generality is that the calculation will be exactly the same if we made the other assumption. In other words, if we were to, uh, to assume that M was odd and N was even. Okay, so now let's get to it. So M equals 2A and N equals 2B plus 1 for some natural numbers, or maybe we'll work over the integers A and B. Okay. Now let's go ahead and look at their sum. So we've got m plus n is 2a plus 2b plus 1. But now we can factor a 2 out of the first two terms, leaving us with 2 times a plus b plus 1. But now that's very clearly an odd number. Great. And that finishes this proof. And we're done with the video now. That's a good place to stop.